gaining knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in reality is something that is crystal clear. The path toward reaching God is apparent. But the problem is that we hinder ourselves from reaching that destination. Which is why we need to state several times throughout the day, إِحْنَنَا الصَّرَاتَ mustaqim." O oh Allah, guide us toward the straight path. Many people, they have this perception that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very far from us, when in reality, we are far from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yet He is very close to us. It is stated in a narration one day, a man, he comes toward the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and he says, Ya Rasulallah, أَرَبُّكَ بَعِيدٌ فَأُنَادِي أَوْ قَرِيبٌ فَأُنَاجِي Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is your Lord far that I need to scream out and call out to Him, Oh Allah! Or is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala close so that I can whisper to Him? At this moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala received the revelation from Jibra'il, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in which He states, إِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ that when that servant of mine asks about me, tell him that I am near. And that I hear his call whenever he seeks me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clear to the human being. He is close to the human being. But we put certain hurdles and obstacles in terms of reaching that destination of ours. And we begin to place idols on this path toward him. When in reality Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is present side by side, Aynama kuntum, as he states within the whole of Quran. Of course, not physically, but metaphorically. Within the next segment of ayat of the whole of Quran from chapter 72, we see this point that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is apparent toward his creation. But it is us who stop ourselves from submitting toward the fact that we are in reality very close in proximity, spiritually toward him. And we are the one who placed these hurdles and boundaries. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in verse number 11 in Surah Al-Jinn, quoting the jinn, وَعَنَّا مِنَ الصَّالِحُونَ وَمِنَّ دُونَ الظَّالِكْ كُنَّ تَرَائِقَ قِدَدَ In verse number 11 of chapter 72, he's quoting the jinn who are stating that and some of us are the righteous and the other ones are duna ظَالِكْ They're a little bit less than the righteous, meaning that just like the human being, the jinn, they separate into groups in terms of their knowledge, in terms of their worship, in terms of their religiosity, so to state. For instance, these jinn who have now submitted toward the teachings of the Holy Prophet وسلم, they're stating and speaking amongst themselves and stating, look, from amongst the jinn there are those who are righteous, who are ready to submit toward the Holy Prophet And on the flip side, there are those who don't want to submit toward the Prophet. There are those who are less in terms of their worship, less in terms of their obedience. It doesn't mean that you condemn them and pass judgment on those individuals, but we have to realize that people are at different levels. Which is why people are different, I mean, people are different levels in terms of receptivity to the majadis that they hear. And different aspects of receptivity in terms of the knowledge that they're able to acquire. In a narration from one of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salatu was salam, he states, بَعْضُكُمْ أَكْثَرُ الصَّلَاةِ مِنْ بَعْضِ وَبَعْضُكُمْ أَكْثَرُ الْحَجَّ مِنْ بَعْضِ وَبَعْضُكُمْ أَكْثَرُ الصَّدَقَ مِنْ بَعْضِ وَأَفْضَلَكُمْ أَفْضَلُكُمْ مَعْرَفَةً That from within your own communities, you see that there are one group of people who pray more than the other. A second group of people, there are those, for instance, who give more sadaqa than the other. There's a third group of people who go for hajj more than everyone else. But none of that matters. The best amongst you are those who have the most knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who know what they're doing. Their sincerity in the midst of performing that, that a'mal is far more valuable, for instance, than performing a lot of prayers. The one who knows the conditions, spiritual conditions for fasting, that he needs to control his tongue and his eyes and his ears and all of his physical organs while fasting during the holy month of Ramadan, and not only his stomach, that is the one who truly knows the benefit of the holy month of Shah Ramadan, the one who has ma'rafah of this blessed month. So we go back toward this verse of the whole of Quran, 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's quoting the jinn as they're conversing amongst themselves. وَإِنَّا مِنَّ الصَّالِحُونَ وَمِنَّ دُونَ ضَالِكُ that from us there are the righteous ones and there are those people who are not ready to submit. They're stating amongst themselves that certainly we always travel, we always hang out in different sects. We create different denominations. And the Mufassalin of the whole Qur'an, they separate this into different groups. They, sep- they, they have different interpretations of what this particular part of the verse means. One group of Mufassalin of the whole Qur'an, they come forth and they state, that when these jinn are classifying themselves as coming from different sects or denominations, that's in regards to, for instance, their physical beings. Meaning some are dark, some are light, some come from different parts of the world, just like human beings do. But on a second level, and that's probably the more correct meaning in terms of the context that we're understanding this particular verse from, is the fact that jinn, they always hang out on the basis of how religious they are in terms of their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For instance, we are all mosque goers. We come to the mosque during the holy month of Ramadan. We talk with one another. We converse with one another. We sit with one another. Then there are people, for instance, who only come for iftar. Maybe we don't get along with them as much as we do with the people who are always coming to the, whole, coming to the mosque during the holy month of Ramadan because we have some similarities. We're on the same wavelength. We have the same ideology when we're coming to the center, for instance. Naturally, the human being, like the jinn, they always form their own cliques. They're always gathered within their own circles. Like the jinn, they also do the same thing. And you see that this is a custom from email, even amongst the companions of Ahlul Bayt And we take examples from that. Then we come forth and we see, for instance, that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt they would have specific companions, and those companions, they would relegate themselves towards specific groups on the level of what their knowledge was of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and of the Imam. For instance, we see in a narration of Ahlul Bayt or within the books of history, we see that amongst those companions of Ahlul Bayt who used to form their own gathering was an individual by the name of Mithamat Tamar. Mithamat Tamar, many of us know, the one who had that intense love for Amir al Mu'mineen. And with him is Habib ibn Madah on this specific occasion. And take a look at the conversation between these two companions of Ahlul Bayt. It is said that one day, Mithamat Tamar, Habib ibn Madah, they're walking in the streets of Kufa. And they begin to converse with one another. Look at the level of knowledge that these people are conversing about. And it's said that Habib bin Madahar, he looks toward Mitham at Tamar, he says, Oh Mitham, he says, it is, it, it is as if that I can see that day that Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, has promised us when he has stated that you are going to die with your last words being in praise of Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wasalam. They're speaking about the way that they're going to die. And it said at this moment, Mitham al Tamar, he looks toward Habib and he says, Oh Habib, and it is as if that I can see that day that Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, has promised us that you will be defending our master Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, and dying between his arms on the day of Ashura. So we see that there is this type of ma'rafah, there is this type of level of understanding, of receptivity from these companions of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wasalam, that these type of individuals who have this type of knowledge, they always hang out within the same, within their same gatherings, within their same circles. Just like the jinn, وَإِنَّا مِنَ مِنَ الصَّالِحُونَ وَمِنَّ دُونَ الضَّالِكُ That some of us, we are amongst the righteous, and some of us are less in terms of our worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. كُنَّا تَرَائِقَ قَدَدًا Surely they segregate themselves, or they create different sects and denominations from amongst themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, وَأَنَّا بَنَنَّا أَن لَن نُؤْجِزَ اللَّهِ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَن نُؤْجِزَهُ حَرَبًا They're speaking amongst themselves. Now after they've submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after, sub- after they've submitted to the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, they're stating, now we know that there's no way of fleeing from the kingdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We stayed in Dua Kumail, وَلَا يُمْكِنُ الْفِرَارَ مِنْ حُكُومَتَكَ O oh Allah, and there is no way to run away from your kingdom. Everywhere we go, we are in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everywhere we look, we are in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No matter if we go to the east of the world, or to the west of the world, or to the moon, or to the sun, or to the stars, or to Mars, or to Jupiter, all of this is the guardianship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These jinn are reflecting amongst themselves. They're stating 
that we have now realized that there is no way to escape the kingdom of God. You see, the problem is with the human being is that sometimes we believe that we are not in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is why we commit sin. One time, a man, he comes toward one of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, والسلام, if I remember the story correctly, I believe it was Imam Rada alayhi salatu wasalam, and he says, Yabda Rasulullah. Do you have some sort of power that is compelling you to force you to never commit any sin? Or do you choose not to commit any sin? The Imams of Ahlul Bayt are infallible. What leads you toward this? The Imam alayhi salatu wasalam, he states, he responds toward this man. He said, would you leave your house without dressing appropriately, uh, dressing appropriately, walking without any clothes in the middle of these streets? He says, of course I wouldn't do that. He says, why? He says, people are watching. Why would I do such a thing? He says, we Ahlul Bayt والسلام, never perform any act of sin because we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always watching us. The problem is with the human being is that we go through this phase where we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he can't see. Or even if he can see, we don't really care about it. Naturally, when we take a look at our own selves in terms of our own nature, when we are at home, for instance, we will never commit a sin in front of our spouse. We will never commit a sin in front of our children. We will never commit a sin in front of our community members. Probably would never commit a sin even if an animal was present in that same room. But we commit sins every single day in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our perception of God is something which is of a very low level of ma'rafah. This is the problem. These jinn, after hearing the ayat of the Qur'an, after allowing for their hearts to be receptive toward the divine commandments of God, they stated that now we know that there's no way that we can run away from the kingdom of God. وَلَا يُمْكِنُ الْفَرَارَ مِنْ حُكُومَتِهِ Everywhere we go, we are in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is why we'll never even think about committing sin. وَأَنَّا ظَنَنَّا أَلَّنْ نُؤْجِزَ اللَّهَ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَنْ نُؤْجِزَهُ حَرَبًا And no matter how far away that we try to run, no matter where we go in this massive universe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is always present, He is always surrounding us, He is always there. So like we said that the problem with the human being is that we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we create certain veils and barriers over our hearts and over our eyes that do not allow us to understand His authority over this universe. The thing is with the human being, for instance, we know and we see narrations of Ahlul Bayt, والسلام, they point toward this very fact. The human being, our intellects are very weak. The situation is such that we often form pictures of God. Unfortunately, especially when we're children, for instance, or when we ha- and, and as we increase in our knowledge, the less we tend to do this. But we begin to picture Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like ourselves. We can't do that. This is a sin. This could lead us toward the possibility of worshipping that picture that we have created in our minds. But this is unfortunately the nature of the human being that we need to constantly get over this particular phase that we're in. In fact, some of the ulama, they state that even an ant, an ant that is walking in the middle of the desert, in the middle of the sand, how does it picture Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be? The same way that perhaps we picture Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have hands and eyes and ears like these you know, Wahhabis, they state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be sitting on a throne and his dimensions are like this and so on and so forth. Of course, when the school of Ahlul Bayt, we reject all of this. Even the ant pictures Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with two antennas, right? We have to get over this and we need to increase in our ma'rafah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove all of these sorts of images and realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the guardian of all of this. He is the creator of all of this. And when we begin to humble ourselves in front of that God, then we will realize that we cannot, how, or how dare we ever commit any sort of sin or vice or transgression in front of this Allah. The Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wa salam, Imam al-Hasan al-Mujtaba alayhi salam, when he, would be for, when he would be performing the wudu, as we've heard the story since we've been kids, that as he would be performing the wudu, his face would turn yellow. When they would come toward the Imam, they would say, Yabda Rasulullah, are you sick? Is everything okay? He says, I realize who I am about to go and stand in front of at the time of salat. And his face changes because of that ma'rafa that the Imam of Ahlul Bayt has. We need to be amongst those who walk in, that, in those Footsteps of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. They continue, they're conversing amongst themselves. 
amanna bih. And the moment that we heard those words of guidance from the tongue of the Holy Prophet sallallahu the minute that he began to recite the ayat and the verses of the Holy Quran, we fell in submission toward that. Because when someone presents the truth toward you, naturally you are inclined to submit toward that truth. But the problem is we recite the Holy Quran day and night, but we're not ready to submit and have that certainty with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَعَنَّا لَمَّا سَمِعْنَا الْهُدَى أَمَنَّا بِعْ فَمَنْ يُؤْمِنْ بِرَبِّهِ فَلَا يَخَافُ بَخْصًا وَلَا رَحَقًا And then they continue and they state that when an individual, he submits toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and believes in God, he should not be fearful of any sort of poverty, nor should he be fearful of any sort of disgrace. When you build a link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing bothers you anymore. And you take a look and you see the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who does Allah love the most? The prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those whom he loves the most. The imams of Ahlul Bayt, the awliya of Allah, those are the ones who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the most. But at the same time, who do we see are the most poorest of all of creation? The prophets of Allah, the imams of Ahlul Bayt. They have few friends, they have a little bit of wealth. But none of this matters to them because they have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Narration as they come forth and they tell us. The first of all, we take a look at the way that Isa ibn Maryam used to live. Abstaining from the dunya. Narrations come forth and they tell us Musa ibn Imran, Prophet Musa والسلام, he was so poor, he had such little provisions in his life that the majority of his life in his earlier age in terms of his youth, he would be eating grass. He would be eating grass until the pigment of his skin began to change to the color green. It is stated that one day, Musa والسلام, he begins to seek and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he was in intense hunger in the middle of the desert. He was saying, oh Allah, give me something. Give me something from your bounties and from, from your blessings so I can go back and be obedient toward you. Sometimes you need provision, right? During the month of Ramadan, we get tired from fasting that we don't want to spend the day in the of Quran. It's difficult sometimes, especially with a long fast, 16, 17, 18 hours. It's very difficult. Musa alayhi salatu wasalam says, Oh Allah, give me a little bit of your bounties and of your blessings so I can spend my day in obedience toward you. A couple of moments later, perhaps Musa alayhi salatu wasalam was only asking for a loaf of bread or a piece of bread, right? But a couple of moments or days later, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses Musa and gives him a lot more than that. He doesn't only give him bread. What does he give him? He gives him a wife. He gives him a father-in-law in terms of Sha'ib, that whole story. When Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, went toward that well, he saw the two daughters of Sha'ib, and you all know the whole story. He gave him a job, he gave him a home, just for that sincere dua of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. But the first step is to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always there. Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wasalam, they lived a life of dejection from the community. They were marginalized, they were, they were disrespected. We've been speaking about Prophet Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam last week. We saw that Nuh والسلام, has nobody at his support, but he knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. When someone has God, no matter what type of trials and tribulation that they go with, that they're going through, they say, forget about it, because my God is greater than all of this. When you're in poverty, you say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is multi. When you're sick, you say that I was healthy one day. When some individual, they have a back pain, they say, you know what? At least my eyes are okay. When you have a cold, you say, you know what? At least I can walk up, I can walk and I can move around. That's what it means to really believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be content with Him in all situations. When someone has contentment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is content with him. And when someone has contentment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing bothers him. Which is why these jinn, they're conversing amongst themselves. And they're saying, now that we believe in God, not, none, none, none of the uh, trials of life, they bother us. فَلَا يَخَافُ بَخْصًا وَلَا رَهَقًا we, we don't have any concerns about this world. We're not worried about being disgraced. We're not worried about people laughing at us for us following in the religion of the Holy Prophet We don't care if we're poor, if we're rich, it doesn't bother us. Because what we do have is the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our hearts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues quoting those jinn, وَأَنَّا مِنَّ الْمُسْلِمُونَ وَمِنَّ الْقَاسِتُونَ فَمَنْ أَسْلَمَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ تَحَرَّوْ رَشَدًا And from amongst us, we have those who submit toward God. Again, like we quoted in the previous verse. And from amongst us are those who are the wrongdoers. فَمَنْ أَسْلَمَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ تَحَرَّوْ رَشَدًا 
And for those who submit toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have submitted towards something very good. They have been led or they're going to be led towards success. We come forth and we see that in the whole Quran, there is a mention of two different types of submission toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first type of submission is what is known as obligatory submission. And the second phase is what is known as voluntary submission. Obligatory submission is the fact that every single one of us, we submit toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one way or another. For instance, the whole of Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that the mountains, they submit toward God. The trees, they submit toward God. The oceans, they recite the tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The birds flying in the sky and the fish in the ocean, they all submit toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You and I, whether we believe in God, whether we don't believe in God, whether a human being is an atheist or an agnostic or someone who you know, is an idol worshiper, he himself or she, she herself are a testimony in the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because every breath we take, every step we take, every time our eye blinks, in reality, this is an example of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whether you like it or not, you are submitting toward the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you. Whether you reject Him or not, in reality, some way, some phase within your life, you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has created you. And the fact that you have been created by Him is a testimony in His very existence. For instance, whether we choose to pray or not to pray, whether we choose to fast or not to fast, whether we choose to go for the pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca or not, we, without any sort of a doubt, have submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every single breath that we take. Because in that previous world, in the Adam of Dhar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked us, Alastu rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And in that existence, in that pre-world, in the world of spirits, we stated, Oh Allah, yes, and we testify in your existence. But there's a higher level of submission than this obligatory submission that all creations they perform just by their very being and by their very presence. And that is what is known as those individuals, voluntary submission, those individuals who submit toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willingly and with the knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is their creator. The fact that we choose to pray, the fact that we choose to fast, the fact that we choose to go for hajj. The fact that we choose to seek him and supplicate to him and recite munajat toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are all dimensions of this voluntary submission. The fact that I choose to be a worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the submission that these jinn are talking about in this conversation. They come forth and they're stating, وَأَنَّا مِنَّ مِنَّ الْمُسْلِمُونَ وَمِنَّ الْقَاسِتُونَ فَمَنْ أَسْلَمَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ that those who submit toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will be taken toward perfection. They will be taken toward guidance. Sometimes we don't necessarily understand, but the more that we worship, the more that we submit, the more that we, underst the more that we understand and recognize that our minds can't understand everything, then by that token, Allah subhanahu, subhanahu wa ta'ala will put the light of knowledge in our heart and put the light of knowledge within our souls. For those who believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take them toward guidance. But for those who transgress, they will be the fuel for the fires of hell. The question that we need to pose when we recite this particular ayah of the whole of Quran, and this is how we need to recite the whole of Quran and contemplate upon its verses, is why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala state that those who disbelieve and those who transgress they will be the individuals who are the fuel for the fires of hell. And not they will just enter into the fires of hell and receive punishment. Why this distinction? And why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use this type of strong terminology? Because there are some people who are sinners. There are some people who are bad individuals. They do awful things. They commit treachery in the community. They commit sins on their own in their own house. And that's fine. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish them for committing such an action. But then there are individuals who take it to the next level. They don't only commit transgressions of the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on their own, but what do they do even more than that? They bring everyone else down with them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, for those people, they won't only be thrown into receiving the punishment of God, but they will be the cause of that fire to be building up in the fires of hell. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from that punishment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in verse number 16, and inshallah, we won't have time to conclude this, but let me just make a pr- brief mention of this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in verse number 16, and for those individuals who remain firm, they remain firm on their religion, they remain firm when trying to seek the right path. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring them from the skies abundant water. What does this mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is stating that there are a group of people who make their very best effort to state on Salat al Mustaqim. They make their very best effort to go and find that right path. They do the things that they need to do, they make their best effort. They do their very best to seek. They try to increase in their knowledge. They question when they have to question. They do their very best in terms of their relationship with their families and with their friends and with their communities. They pray and they fast. They fulfill their responsibilities toward God. And if they do that, if people collectively, communally are firm in submitting toward this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow for abundant water to fall down from the skies. And as we mentioned before, when we spoke about Prophet Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions abundant water, He's not speaking solely about water that's coming down from the skies. But rather He's speaking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's bounties and blessings, you will be able to extract them from ways that you could have never imagined. If communities during the times of the previous prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah mentions this within the whole Qur'an, if the people of Bani Israel, they submitted toward their prophets, they would have been able to attain the bounties of this world. They would have had fruits from on the trees and from under them. And they would have had food to eat and the bounties and this deliciousness of God's blessing from all around them from ways that they couldn't have even imagined. But the problem is that the community, they neglected their prophets. The problem is that the community, they neglected the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The communities, they neglected the imams of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salatu wa But if they knew what was with the Ahlul Bayt, if they knew what was with the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they would have been able to attain great heights that our intellects cannot perceive. Let me give you an example. For those individuals who hold, held steadfast toward the prophets of Allah, who held steadfast to the imams of Ahlul Bayt, see the, see the levels that they have reached. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wa salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wa salam, according to Shaykh al-Mufid, has between 4,000 and 20,000 students in the seminary. 4,000 who, are, 4, who, are, who are his close confidants, but another 16,000 individuals who are sitting in the lessons of Imam Ja'far bin Muhammad. Imagine 20,000 students. Yet Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wa salam, he states, the people of Medina have abandoned me. Why? Keep this to the side. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wa salam One day he is in the middle of the desert And he is alone And he is, has his head in the ground Perhaps seeking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Making sujood Kumail ibn Ziyad he comes toward The Imam alayhi salatu wa salam He says, oh Amir al-Mu'mineen Why do I see you in such a state? Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wa salam says I have the knowledge of the, I have the, knowledge of the heavens and the earth he states as he points toward his heart. Over here is knowledge and ma'rafa and its completion. But no one wants to come and ask me. Saluni, saluni, qabla an tafqiduni. Saluni an turaqa as-sama fa inni a'lamu baha min turaqa al-arm. I am, ask me, ask me before you lose me. Ask me on the heavens, ask me about the heavens. For surely I am more knowledgeable about that than the earth. But no one wants to come and ask me. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, like we mentioned, 20,000 students, but he says the people of Medina have abandoned me. Why? Because few people, they realize that with these individuals is the secret of the heavens and the earth. One of those individuals who realized the presence of the Imam, who realized the status of the Imam alayhi salatu wasalam, was a man by the name of Jabir ibn Hayyan. You know who is Jabir ibn Hayyan? Jabir ibn Hayyan is a man who has written more than 3,000 treatises in philosophy, in medicine, in biology, in chemistry, in algebra, more than 3,000 pieces of literature from Jabir bin Hayyan. He's a direct student of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, and go today when you go home and type in Jabir bin Hayyan in English 
on, on, on Google and go to the first link on Wikipedia and see what they say about Jabir ibn Hayyan. Jabir ibn Hayyan, the father of modern day chemistry. Jabir ibn Hayyan, the man who said, the first man who, the first man who came forth and stated that the atoms, they have power and they have energy and things can be created from them. This is Jabir ibn Hayyan. We're talking in the six, second century in the history of the religion of Islam. A direct student of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu Going back to where this verse of the whole Qur'an, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala state? He comes forth and he tells the community, he states, Baba, if you listen and if you stayed on the path, we would have brought down toward you secrets from the skies that you could have never imagined otherwise. One man, Jabra bin Hayyan, he has the ability to write this many treatises that are studied and reflected upon in academia till this very day. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, who research in France and PhD dissertations have been written about his life from non-Muslims, from non-followers of Ahlul Bayt, they come forth and they state and they try to make the conclusion, try to make the argument that the first man who stated, the first man who openly stated and preached and wrote about the fact that the earth is not the center of the world and rather is the sun, is Ja'far ibn Muhammad, before Copernicus, before Galileo, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, but we, the school of Ahlul Bayt, the followers of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, we neglected these individuals and we're living in the station that we're living in. So we need to go back and reflect. And when we read this verse of the whole Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, the human being and the jinn, that if you had followed suit with the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you would have been able to attain heights no one could have even imagined. We would have brought down for you and showed you the secrets and the blessings of this universe, but you left it. We need to pose that same question to ourselves. Have we held steadfast toward Ahlul Bayt والسلام, or have we left them behind? Have we gone ahead of them? Have we left them behind? Or are we standing next to them? Because in reality, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have brought down so many unique blessings from the skies, from the earth, from the sun, from the moon. We would have been able to reach heights that we could have never imagined. But the first prerequisite toward that, toward that fact is the fact that we need to stay on course with the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, the Holy Prophet, and the Holy Quran. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq. Inshallah, tomorrow we'll continue our commentary of chapter 72 of the whole Qur'an. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we will be able to become amongst those who are the contemplators, the reciters of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Walhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahumma ala sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammad wa alihi al-tayyibina al-tahirin wa rahimallah man qara'a suratul mubarakatul fatiha.